uh, although I'm still, as you can see, engaged. <laughs> Along with hosting sponsor The Edgewater, supporting sponsor Johnson Bank, production partner the University of Wisconsin Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies, and media partner the Isthmus. <coughs> First Weber is proud to be the presenting sponsor of Yahara Lakes 101 Lake Science Cafe. This month's talk is titled Love in the Lake. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day. More than a talk in more on the talk in a minute. First, a big thank you to all the businesses who became or recommitted to Lake Partners in the month of January. Lake Partners make yearly donations outside of events or programs that go directly to lake education, improvement, or monitoring initiatives. I'd also like to mention that two weekends ago, Clean Lakes Alliance held its seventh annual Frozen Assets, which drew roughly 6,000 people to the Edgewater for the outdoor, uh, outdoor festival and raised $150,000 for Clean Lakes. <laughs> now to tell us more about this month's talk and, uh, is Adam Soderstein. Uh, Adam? Good morning, everybody. Uh, I am not Beth Cutler from Kid Mutual Group. Um, Beth was actually uh, going to present uh, here this morning and introduce our speaker. Uh, Dave Kuna is our monthly sponsor. Uh, they're a lake partner and they uh, participate in volunteer activities every year, but Beth, unfortunately, is under the weather, so you get me. Uh, today, as Morning mentioned, our talk is Valentine's Day appropriate love in lakes. Um, so we'll dive right into reproductive habits of different fish different plant species, and how they successfully pass their genes on to the next generation, I am excited. Uh, so our speaker this month is Justin Schenner from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Justin began his career in water resource hauling invasive weeds from Charles River in Boston, Mass. Chuck. Nobody calls that Chuck. Maybe just in the movies. Uh, <laughs> He founded, he loved working with water, moved to Madison in 2013 to pursue his master's in water resource management here at the UW. He is currently employed by the Department of Natural Resources in the water monitoring section, and most importantly, he used to work for Clean Lakes Alliance, and he's done a number of things for us, including surveying lake users, supporting our monitoring program, making maps, analyzing water, just an all around nice guy. So please join me in welcoming Justin. Strategies mean for our interaction with the species. 
as humans as uh, major uh, ch changers of the environment. All right, so northern pike. Um, you know, this is this is a you know, Madison has a great northern pike fishery that draws in a lot of tourism, um, and that's true in many places across the state. So it's important to understand um, the reproductive habits of this fish. Um, so they're solitary hunters, right? Um, they're going to use their speed and strength to ambush prey, um, and and use those chompers right there. Um, but their main obstacle is how do you get your young to a size where they are no longer vulnerable. So uh, you know, a, a three foot northern pike swimming around the lake does not have too many enemies other than anglers to worry about. Um, but when fish are small, it's an entirely different story. So this is what a northern pike looks like after the egg has just been fertilized. Um, these two large spheres here are the, uh, the yolk. That's what the, the young fry is going to rely upon in its first um, few weeks of life. And down here, these are the eyes of the developing pike. Um, but the point here is to show that you know, this looks just really delicious to a lot of critters, um, even small invertebrates. We'll say, you know, that looks like a, a delicious meal. It's nutrient dense, it's energy dense. Um, so, so when pike uh, lay their eggs, they're you know, basically setting out a buffet. So, so the goal is how do you get these eggs to the sides where they're going to find um, fewer and fewer fish are able to eat them. Well, and the pike strategy for doing that is to pick a lovely nursery, right? So like good parents, they find a good nursery for their young. This is a, uh, a wetland um, connected to Green Bay, which has another great pike fishery that brings in tourism dollars. So um, it's, it's a little hard to see, but what, what you should notice is that there is emergent plants growing out of the water. Um, the water here is pretty shallow, and there's going to be all sorts of little back channels and kind of like a maze of shallow water, you know, mixed in with plants. Uh, the topography is very variable, so it's, it's like a complex area um, with just a few inches of water. And the important part is the plants. We'll get we'll get um, we'll get back to why those plants are important in a minute. But so if this is your nursery, your next problem is how do you make sure that everybody gets there at the same time to spawn? And pike are actually triggered um, to spawn by uh, changes in water temperature. So right after, uh, right in the, early, in the early, early spring when the water hits 35, 37, 39 degrees Fahrenheit, um, pike start moving upstream looking for places like this. And they'll actually swim under ice cover up, um, upstream as soon as they can fit under there. They're, they're immediately looking to get a head start um, on spawning. And places like this, where the water is so shallow, the water there is going to warm up faster from the sunlight than you know in a, in a deep lake. So they're looking for these warm places, relatively warm, because they want to get their young a head start, and they want um, because fish um, fish growth is, is really dependent on the temperature. So they're trying to find the warmest place to put their young, um, so that they can grow quickly. And again, the faster you grow, the faster you become too large for other fish to eat. So that's their goal. Um, so, if, so here's some pike on the left hand side. These guys are still relying on their yolk um, for nutrients. Um, but in just a few weeks, they will reach this size, which you know it looks like still a very, very small fish, but already this fish is big enough where the predators that would prey upon these guys, um, you know, they, they can't fit that in their mouth or it's too big. This guy's already feeding on invertebrates, so it's become predatory. Um, and it might actually feed on some of its brothers and sisters that aren't growing as fast. Um, so that's the non-romantic part of the love of the lake. <laughs> um, so the idea is, you know, these, these pike are growing very, very quickly because the water temperature is, because the nursery was great, right? So here's what it looks like underwater. Um, we've got a, 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 a pike that might be spawning here. Um, and notice how dense this vegetation is. This, this vegetation, this uh, vegetation doesn't have to be alive, but it's this complex um, kind of matrix of vegetation underwater. So what actually happens during the spawning, um, you know, this is a great nursery site. So a female will come through, um, again, skewed by the, the water temperature, and actually they'll try to return to the place where they spawned last year. So they're going to return to the same spawn, spawning site over and over again. Um, so the female will come through and deposit eggs 
not all at once, right, but in, in uh, bunches of a few dozen. And she's got hundreds of thousands of eggs, but she's going to spread them out, you know, so put all your eggs in one nursery, right? So, um, so by spreading them out, she's giving her young a better shot. You know, some of those clumps of eggs will definitely be found and devoured, but if you spread them out, more are likely to succeed in the long term. Okay, so she's uh, spreading out clumps of eggs. She's actually, there's glue on the eggs that makes them attached to these stalks of vegetation. And that's important because it's bringing them out of the mucky sediment, and so there's plenty of oxygen for those eggs. Um, so it's giving them oxygen to grow and survive, and warmth to, to grow quickly. Um, so the female will come through depositing eggs in different places, and then followed by a group of males who will fertilize them all. Um, you know, maybe in the same place they did last year. Um, and the pike will start developing in this nursery, and you know, a, a small percentage will survive to you know a, a you know a trophy pike size. However, they've kind of given them the best possible chance to do that. And so. This, this is a picture from 1921, just to make a point, we, you know, we have a long-standing relationship with pike, um, and in Wisconsin, it's obviously a huge angling tradition here. Um, and it turns out that the number one thing, if you want to have a successful pike population, is habitat for spawning. So it all comes back to that reproduction, right? So if you, if you have good habitat for pike to spawn, you're likely to have a, a healthy pike population. Um, and you know, so if, if you were to drain wetlands and alter the shoreline, and um, also, um, and, and you know, if you remove that habitat, the pike are not going to do it as well. But the, and um, I mentioned earlier that they return to the same spot over and over again. But the good news is that if you restore a wetland, if you take it um, from a unsuitable habitat, you know, you add maybe some plants, to restore maybe a natural spring. Um, hydrologic regime where the water level rises in the spring, you know, to flood out that vegetation. If you restore a wetland, there are some adventurous pike who will not return to their same spawning habitat and will instead go seek out new places to spawn. So you know, 75% of the pike are returning, returning to the same uh, spawning area every year. Some of them are adventurous, they have that adventure gene or whatever, and um, you know, may and will go find these restored wetlands if we build them. So that's good news for the future in our relationship. Um, so, we'll move, oh, so we'll do a quick summary of the pike. So they have hundreds of thousands of eggs, very few survive. Their strategy is to find a good nursery, and then they, you know, they're not exemplary parents. They find a good nursery, and then they, they're out. They're, uh, they're going to go back to hunting. Good luck, guys. Okay. See you next year. Um, and their main obstacle is this habitat. So if the habitat's there, they're great. If not, the population might be stressed. We'll move on to our second species, another very, very successful fish. They're uh, fans of more warm water than pike. Basically, the only place you won't find them are in cold, fast-flowing streams. Um, <coughs> not just in Wisconsin, again, widespread throughout the United States. So whatever they're doing for reproduction is working. Um, but right away, we're going to see that they have a different strategy for, for, uh, than pike. They're, the males are going to provide a certain amount of parental care. Um, but there, of course, are some males who don't want to put in the work, who want to uh, get away with reproducing without doing any work. Maybe we all know one, you know. Um, <laughs> so what we, so this, this is uh, the bluegill strategy summed up in one picture. Uh, what, what these like circular craters are, are, uh, are they're uh, fish nests, which we call reds, R-E-D-D. -D. I think James said I shouldn't use too many science words, so that's one. That's one, I get one. Maybe I get three. We'll say so that's one. Um, so these fish uh, reds are made by male bluegill. Um, they're cued to spawn by water temperature again, but it's a it's a higher water temperature. You know, they're a warm water species, so it's more like uh, upper 60s where they start to spawn. The males go and make these colonies of reds. Um, they use their tails to fan debris out of the way and will actually use their snouts to you know move little cobblestones around and basically make these very very um, sweet bluegill bachelor pads. Um, so you have a whole bunch of males working really hard. Um, the females come through in a group, and when the males see that, they start swimming around in circles very quickly to show off their cool bachelor pad. This is not the type of bachelor pad with like Cheetos on the ground. This is a place where you actually might feel comfortable leaving your young for a, for a suitable <laughs> night. So the females come through, they're checking out the bachelor pads, the males are swimming in a circle, and the females will deposit eggs if they like the the red that has been made. Um, 
Um, and again, they're, they're not going to put them all in one nest. They're going to kind of head to their beds and spread, spread their eggs around a little bit. Um, but the, if the male is successful, the females will lay eggs there. The males will fertilize them. And they'll actually stay with the eggs and then the fry when the fry hatch. They'll stay for a few days up to a week, um, protecting them. And interestingly, they'll also, uh, once the eggs are sitting there, they'll fan the eggs with their tails. And that's, again, to move oxygen over the eggs. Um, to keep them uh, to keep them alive, they need oxygen to survive. Um, and then they're going to hatch, and they will, the bluegills will protect them from whatever predators they can. Um, obviously, as a bluegill, you're not a pike, so only the largest bluegill really gets to the size where there's where they uh, are safe from predators. You have to be a really big bluegill to not worry about getting eaten. So that's going to you know that's going to affect their reproductive strategy. All right, so that was, those were the bluegills who were good dads. They were building the nest, right? But this is where it gets interesting. So this large fish in the middle, this is a parental male. This is a good bluegill dad who made his nest. Below them is a female. And this is a second type of male um, that's called a sneaker. And very literally, these guys wait until the females have deposited their eggs, um, sneak into the nest, and try to fertilize them before they are chased off by the larger bluegill. So it's a, you know, they don't, they don't, it doesn't make them look too good, right? But, they're, but it's another reproductive strategy. It's a different way to get things done. So, you know, if you can do this, if you, if you are able to get in there, fertilize the eggs, and escape, um, you did not have to build a nest. Um, you didn't have to watch the eggs. And any, any parents will agree, if you are building a nest and watching your young, you know what you're not doing is take care of yourself, right? You're not eating, you're probably not doing bluegill workouts in there to stay in shape. So, so this guy's investing all sorts of time and energy in making this nest and watching the young. And this guy doesn't have to do that. If he, if he is successful, he gets to uh, contribute genes to the next, next generation with very little effort. Um, and then I should mention, so this guy will grow into the female mimic. So this is another male who's, who's so as this guy grows, his strategy switches to um, becoming a, basically looking like a female, and that's again to basically do the same thing, to allow yourself to get close to the parental male. He thinks this is another female, so you might be able to, again, fertilize eggs that way, and then uh, escape. So you think like, wow, you know, this looks like a great strategy, right? Well, um, if, you, if you're a, this type of male, um, you're, you're not growing to be this size, right? So you're putting yourself more at risk for predation by taking this strategy. Um, so, you know, it's kind of a trade-off, right? You can, you know, and, and, and these guys depend on the nests made by the larger male. So if everybody tried to be a sneaker male, it wouldn't work. You have to have a certain proportion of the male, um, you know, doing the work um, and, and uh, maybe potentially getting taken advantage of, but they do have a way to fight back. They think there's research that suggests that the larger males can actually kind of smell the difference between the young and will preferentially eat the, the young of the, of the males that, that um, snuck into their nest. So they kind of have a way to fight back against that. But thinking about um, our relationship with the species, you know, if you are an angler in Monona Bay and you were pulling up uh, these little, you know, female mimic males and sneaker males, um, you know, you, you might toss those back, they're probably not big enough to eat. But if you pull up a French one, they'll be able to be big enough that you want to fry it up. So, you know, we've been doing this for years and years and years, and people are wondering, you know, what does that mean for the population as a whole? Obviously, the, pot, the blue, we've been fishing bluegill for a long time in these lakes, and the population is not crap. But it's important to think about, you know, maybe there's something, you know, maybe if we want really, really big bluegill, um, should we, you know, throw back some of these parental males? Um, should we remove some of the other males? You know, we're not really sure what that's going to mean for the population as a whole. So it's this, so as opposed to fight, there's this kind of, you know, competing strategies in a single uh, species. And like I said, you know, the, the sneaker males depend on the nests made by the parental males. Um, and one study found that uh, there are, there, in a particular population of bluegill, there were more of the small males trying to sneak However, they were overall less successful at passing their genes down to the next generation. So in that case, at least, the, the parental males are running out. So let's add them to our chart here. They're going to produce fewer eggs, but overall, those eggs have a better chance of survival, just even from those few days of the male fanning them and protecting them while they're the smallest. Um, and then they, you know, the, the fry become mobile, and they'll start hunting um, you know, zooplankton in the water pretty soon. So you can be a good dad or try to be a sneaky one. Um, and
And they're, again, the shoreline habitat is critical for bluegill. They're, I think they're a little less picky um, than pike, um, but they still need, you know, uh, that kind of gravelly, sandy bottom to make their nests. Um, and, and, and unlike pike, they are always vulnerable to predators. So that's another little, you know, those senior males may be able to reproduce, but might get eaten too. All right, so we'll move away from fish. We'll, we'll talk about daphne for a while. We like them, of course. These are the, the cows of the lake that are grazing on the plankton, uh, making the lake clear. Um, and daphnia, when I say daphnia, there are many uh, subspecies of daphnia, or, or not subspecies, but daphnia. There's daphnia culex, daphnia pulicaria. They're all different species, but we have a few of them in Lake Mendota. Again, very successful. You'll find these guys all over the world in many, many, many different types of lakes. Um, and so overall, they, well, they've got a good strategy. They're actually related to constraints, distantly related to crabs and lobsters. Um, and just like bluegill, they're, they're always prey, right? So if it's not invertebrates preying on them, there are some types of fish. We know that spiny water fleas love to eat these guys. Um, so they've got that kind of dilemma to deal with. They're never going to grow to a size where they are invulnerable. Um, and they're short-lived, so they have to take advantage of good conditions while conditions are there in the lake. So we'll see how they do that. All right, so. Uh, Daphnia have this kind of choice between sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction. So we'll start um, with this, this large Daphnia here. This is a uh, strong female single parent Daphnia who has, um, she's got these eggs in her brood chamber here, and she can just go ahead and produce daughters without any help. Um, and those daughters will then grow and can get to be this size and produce daughters of their own in a matter of weeks. So this is the asexual cycle. There's no um, introduction of new genetic material. So you, this is basically cloning. You're uh, making clones of this daphnia over and over and over again. And so the daughters of those daughters and all the way down, they're all going to be genet uh, genetically identical. And what that means is that if, you're, you know, if you have exactly the same genes as your parents and your parents and all your siblings, the means you're vulnerable to the same thing. So if they're potentially they have a gene that makes them a little more vulnerable to a certain parasite, everybody's vulnerable to that parasite. If they, um, maybe they have a, a gene that makes, makes it hard for them to grow little spines to potentially avoid uh, predation from an invertebrate. If everybody, you know, then everybody's got that vulnerability. But the same thing goes for, um, you know, good genes. You know, if, if this particular daphnia happens to be very good at catching food, um, then all the daphnia produced from that single um, individual, we're going to have that same advantage. So right away, you can see that this is a very easy reproductive cycle to do. You know, there's no mating that needs to happen. There's no fertilization. You have to find another daphnia, right? This can this can just go and go and go. And this is what we see in the spring um, when we have that clear water phase. The daphnia are doing this like crazy because they're like, wow, these conditions are awesome. Let's just make a whole bunch of daughters. And so the daphnia population skyrockets. Um, they eat all of the plankton, and we get that spring clear water phase around May or, or maybe early June. Um, but that's not the whole story. So, so there's also the option um, to this, this female could produce uh, a son, and then that son could mate with a female from a different daphnia, and they're going to make um, eggs, which are the result of sexual reproduction. So the main difference there is that you're combining genetic information from two individuals to get a new mix of traits. And that's really important for generating um, genetic variability in the population overall. Um, that's basically one of, the, one of the arguments that people say this is why um, sexual reproduction is so important because it allows you to create new mixes of traits in the population and overall that makes the population as a whole more resistant to you know, a quick environmental change, or the introduction of a new predator, or a new parasite, or a disease, or something like that. Um, but, if, so if you produce uh, offspring sexually, you'll notice um, there's, only two, there's only two eggs in there, as opposed to, you know, five or more in here. And they're, they're encased in this hard kind of shell. Um, and basically what happens to this this hardy uh, sexual egg is that it's going to fall to the bottom of the lake. It can hang out there for you know decades. Um, 
So, so this is a, a slower process, right? If these things are going to fall to the bottom of the lake, they're going to hang out there and again kind of wait for good conditions when they're you know when they're triggered to hatch. Um, and once they hatch, you can go right back into this cycle if you want. So, um, in, in a lot of daphnia populations, you start seeing more and more of these produced as the winter's coming on, right? So conditions are starting to get a little dicey, um, and the daphnia are like, well, we better have some something. Uh, in the bank in case this asexual population totally crashes. So here's a, a quick, these are actually different species of daphnia, but that's okay for, for this. So just to give you a, a sense of their size, they're very tiny. Um, this daphnia has, um, these are clones, these are asexual um, eggs that she's got in her brood chamber. Um, and this daphnia has those uh, sexually re uh, produced eggs um, with that hard casing around it. So this is this whole thing is going to fall to the bottom of the lake and hang out there. Um, but one thing that I'll point out here is that, you know, definitely are transparent to help them kind of avoid predation. But if you've got these, these are much more darker, um, opaque eggs here. So there's a thought, you know, maybe this guy is actually more vulnerable than the Daphne is producing asexually. So is there a penalty for individual Daphne to go on the sexual that's, and that's kind of like an ongoing subject of research. Um, so we'll do a quick table here. The sexual cycle gets you that really important genetic variety in your population. You get hardy resting eggs, which you know can hang out at the lake sediment for a long, long time. And you can make a new population. Theoretically, even just one egg can hatch, and you could have an entirely new population of daphnia. So I think that's kind of insurance for the future. Um, if something catastrophic were to happen, um, if you get several years of really, really poor conditions, you still got eggs in the bank. Um, but it takes time and energy. So those, you know, producing that hard shell of the egg takes energy, um, and obviously you can't grow the population very quickly for this strategy. So you also got that the other side. It's fast and cheap. You can take advantage of good times, and, and you know, the population will really grow. You can always switch to the other side if things get dicey. But overall, the population is more vulnerable. And interestingly, there's a um, in the high altitude lakes in Europe, there's some populations of daphnia that have totally lost the ability to reproduce sexually. And the theory is that those populations are in, in long term are not going to last as long. There's a guess that um, in, in general, populations that go um, totally to cloning hang around for maybe 20,000 to 100,000 years, whereas you know, these populations of sexual daphnia have, have Potential to be around for much longer just because they've got that increased variability. So there's, um, you know, maybe maybe our Daphne population in the lake here, maybe in a resting egg somewhere in Lake Mendota is that gene that confers resistance to the spiny water flea. Maybe I don't know, but that's but that's the idea is that you know if you have that if you're constantly recombining genetic information from different individuals, um, your population overall is better, it is less vulnerable. Say. So. You know, if you're, the asexual route gives you more offspring um, and faster. The fast method, the sexual method, is for insurance. Um, and obviously, their obstacles are that they're constantly under predation. And in this case, we have the spiny water flea in the Madison Lakes, which is making things a lot more complicated for Daphnia. But they haven't disappeared, right? <coughs> Daphnia is still there. They're hanging on. Their, their densities are down a little bit. But, you know, this, this very, very um, successful predator has been unable to totally eradicate that. All right, so now we'll move into the plant kingdom for a little bit. Um, this is American eelgrass. It's called, also called duck celery, water celery, tape grass, um, and a bunch of other things because it is all over the United States, so people give it different names. Um, this is great um, habitat for fish and invertebrates. You know, if you've got a, a whole bunch of this, it gives places to hide. Um, you know, the fish can maybe feed on insects that are on the plants. And as humans, we really like this stuff. Um, because the more and more aquatic plants like this you have, the less likely it is that the system is going to have algal blooms as well. And so, so these plants are um, using sunlight. They're taking in sunlight, releasing oxygen into the water, which is good for all the other things in the water that need oxygen, like, you know, fish eggs, fish, other insects in the water, they all need oxygen. Their roots are stabilizing the sediment. Um, so there's uh, less dust kicked up, you know, and um, that makes the water clearer. So, as 
And um, actually, there's a, a canvas back duck. The scientific name for that duck comes from this grass because people say, wow, that duck really likes uh, eelgrass. I guess we'll call it the eelgrass duck. Um, so as humans, we really like this stuff. But it's plant, so it can't move. Um, at least individuals can't move. Um, and it also has a choice between asexual reproduction, so you have cloning, and sexual reproduction. But it's kind of a unique plant. So on a typical flower, a typical flower has both male and female parts, right? But this plant is actually separated into two different plants. Um, so the challenge is how do you bring the, the male part together with the female part to reproduce sexually? And you can't just release pollen underwater because it'll clump together and get washed away. So they need a pretty complex um, process to reproduce sexually. First, we'll focus on the asexual side. So if you can see here, this plant has a stem that has grown horizontally and made uh, a new friend right next to it. And so this is a clone. So it's kind of the same thing as Daphne, right? If you, have, if you only have clones, um, they're all vulnerable to the same type of thing. Um, but, the, but they can also produce these tubers, which um, can you know, fly in the sediment for a while, might float down the stream a little bit, and then will um, we'll, uh, sprout when conditions are more favorable. So a lot of populations you know, might use this um, to survive the winter. Um, so, they, so while they're reproducing eggs, actually, they do have this option of, you know, it's kind of like resting state where these things will just hold a bunch of energy so that, you know, when conditions are favorable again, you can go right back to making the leaves and plants and the rest of it. Now, if we look at sexual reproduction, we've got the male flower and the female flower. Um, and these, you know, very, very tiny, very delicate. How are we going to get the pollen here into the female flower while this plant is, is growing underwater. And it doesn't emerge um, out of the, you know, like some plants do. It stays pretty much submerged the whole time. So the way it does this uh, is you may have seen little spiral uh, flowers growing up through the water column. That is this, that is American eelgrass doing its thing. Um, so this is, these are the female flowers that are growing up in this spiral form. They're going to just reach the surface and bloom there. And then they will, they're kind of like sit on the water surface, so it kind of creates a little depression with surface tension. Um, and what happens is that the, the male flower is this part breaks off. This is actually a structure that's holding thousands and thousands of male flowers, which are actually much smaller than these tiny little female flowers. So this structure breaks off underwater, close to the surface, and breaks open. And so now you have all these male flowers floating around on the surface, and some of them will float and kind of get sucked into the female flower, which will then um, be pollinated. It'll close up, retreat underwater, and then produce a fruit, which has hundreds and hundreds of seeds in it. Um, and the thought is that this fruit is actually better at um, floating downstream than those tubers I was talking about earlier. So this is, so if you reproduce sexually, you know, this is a, this is a complex process. I'm sure you guys can imagine a lot of things that could go wrong with that, right? Um, but if you reproduce um, <coughs> sexually, you know, maybe you get to disperse more. So, so that dispersal is really important for getting new populations of this stuff established downstream. So genetic variety I like to talk about as an advantage of that. Um, Get to disperse downstream, but it takes more energy to make those flowers. You know, you're making a flower, you're making a, a, a case for the male flowers, you're going to grow the stem up to the surface, um, and then you've got to hope that you know the male flowers find their way there. So, you know, a sudden change in water level could just submerge all those flowers. If the current picks up, um, the male flowers might just be washed away downstream and not have pollinate. There are a lot of things that can go wrong. So, it's not a it's not a great way to produce all of your plants. So again, the asexual way is awesome because it's fast and cheap. You can just grow a stem sideways, and then you have a friend next to you. It can be good to have friends nearby if you're a plant because um, remember those roots stabilize the sediment. So the more stable your sediment is, um, the less particles are in the water and the less light is blocked. So if you have lots of these plants, they're all holding on sediment. There's plenty of light getting in, and the plants like it. So you'll find. Um, you know, huge beds of this stuff that might all be genetically identical, but they're kind of creating their own little environment that you know, that plants like. Um, you can't pick up and leave, um, so that's the, you know, you can't just 
disperse it easily. And again, the overall, overall population is more vulnerable to a insect or something that's coming along and chowing down. Um, so again, it's this kind of, you know, the population of the whole, obviously the plants aren't making a choice of how much are commonly for each today. But you can kind of think of the species overall as this kind of balance between one strategy and the other, and they kind of got a, you know, it, one will be you know, more advantageous to do one in some circumstances, and more advantageous to do the other in other circumstances. So um, again, it's kind of the same. They're producing tons and tons of flowers, but um, if you are fertilized, if you're doing the asexual route, um, you can basically just, as long as you have plenty of uh, energy and nutrients, you can keep going and keep growing sideways. Same thing, adapting the asexual is that fast and cheap method. This, Sexual uh, method of reproduction gives you insurance for the future. Um, but these guys are vulnerable to eutrophication. So, you know, as humans, if we start uh, putting a bunch of, for example, phosphorus in, in a system, um, eventually, um, so these plants are not able to take advantage of phosphorus um, in the water as easily as the phosphorus that's in the, in the sediment already. So, if we dump a bunch of phosphorus in, Things that can take advantage of phosphorus in the water are algae, right? So the algae can start growing, they can block the light to the plants, um, and it can um, actually cause those plants to die and use up oxygen that way. Um, so that's what they're vulnerable to. You know, they really depend on clear water to survive. But if you let them establish, there's some evidence that maybe they help, you know, they help keep the water clear by pulling down the um, sediment. And maybe even there's some evidence that they're producing chemicals that deter the growth of algae possible, again, ongoing research. Um, so we've got one more row here, we will get to our native mussel. This is the bat nugget. Um, I have, I didn't find this confirmed in the Ahara Lakes, but it is in the Rock River Basin, which the Ahara flows into, so I'd be willing to bet they're somewhere in the Ahara. Um, this is a filter feeder, um, so it's gonna you know, take in water as it's sitting on the bottom of the stream, and uh, pick out the good stuff, and shoot out the rest. Um, they have to reproduce sexually. Um, and interestingly, they have to find a fish to be a host for a while. So they kind of, they parasitize on fish for a certain part of their life cycle. Um, and this is kind of a side note that freshwater mussels are, I think, the most threatened group of organisms in North America. So something like 75% of uh, these freshwater mussels are either, you know, threatened or of concern or endangered or going extinct. Um, so it's important to kind of pay attention to how these guys reproduce. Um, and I, of course, I chose the ominous picture of uh, the fat nugget with two zebra mussels sitting on it. So we'll talk a little bit about that interaction. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to use another science word here. Is James in there? Yep. Oh, okay. <laughs> so these are called, uh, so this is actually two different species, but just pay attention to the large ones. So these are our juvenile uh, mussels called, called Glochidia. This is the stage that has to find a fish um, to attach to, and not just any fish. It's got to be one that's suitable for the species. So um, they really like smallmouth bass. They can also attach to walleye and perch, and maybe bluegill. Maybe bluegill are the best host, but they have to find a species that will um, that can tolerate these guys hanging onto their heels. So um, it doesn't seem like they do the fish too much harm when they do that, but other species will. You know, uh, the immune system of the fish will totally reject these things and they want to survive. So they have to find the right host. So how the heck are you going to get these little, you know, tiny juveniles onto a fish when you're a mussel sitting on the bottom of the stream? Well, you go fishing. Um, so this is a fat bucket that um, has made a little display here. So this is part of the, of what's called the mantle of the mussel. You'll notice that um, that looks kind of like a delicious little minnow. Um, it's even got an eye spot. It's got this kind of patterning. It's got stuff that might look like fins to a fish. You know, a fish maybe down to 20 vision. So they're, 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 they're going around, and a small bass will look at this thing and say, that looks like lunch. Um, and the muscle is actually making this thing pulse um, with muscle contraction. So it really is imitating a wiggling fish. Um, and these guys are, are great anglers. So, um, but what this thing actually has in it is uh, tons and tons. It is just packed full of those juvenile mussels, Glochidia. 
Um, and so when the smallmouth bat comes along, it decides to strike at this. It hits it with its mouth, the, it ruptures, and the glypidia go into the mouth and attach to the gills of that fish. Um, and so that's, this is where it's trying to get. It's trying to get on the gills here. Um, this, is, um, this is actually like a muscle uh, restoration program where they're actually, you know, the, the scientists putting the glypidia on the, on the fish to help, you know, help, it, um, help this muscle species survive. I don't think, I think this is from the West Coast somewhere, but I, I like the picture because it's showing you exactly where these um, little juvenile muscles are going to hang on for a while. They basically just hang on to the fish and then uh, drop off and then they're good to go. So why go to the trouble? You know, you got as you got to make this thing. You got to you got to sit there and pulse them like, come on, come on. <laughs> um, and then you got to make sure that you attach, and then that you drop off in a favor. Why go to all this trouble? Again, it's it's, it's dispersal, right? So um, if muscles just release their young into the stream, they can flow downstream, but fish can go upstream. So if you attach to a fish, you can spread um, the population throughout the entire watershed. Of course, um, if you can build a dam and the fish can't get through, then neither can the muscles, right? Um, so, you know, if we, as we think about, you know, um, our dams and barriers we build, um, it's not just the fish that we're affecting. You know, any any kind of organism that has a relationship with that fish is also going to be affected. That's not to say that we have to take away all the dams, but it's just something to think about. Um, and of course, another sad picture, this poor uh, fat muck is being colonized by zebra mussels. Um, and the zebra mussel does not require a fish host, um, which is part of the reason why they've been so successful. And they will actually totally colonize this mussel and kind of smother it. Um, so this is just to make the point that, you know, we kind of have to think about, um, you know, we have introduced the zebra mussel to a system where these, these native mussels were really, they were doing okay, they were depending on these fish. Um, and now, you know, we've kind of introduced the zebra mussels kind of as an unfair advantage. Um, so, I don't want to end on a sad note, but it's something to think about um, with our native mussels. Um, it's also a cool topic that you can find YouTube videos of this kind of thing going on. It's very, very cool. There are a lot of mussels. Some imitate crayfish and stuff. Um, it's very cool. So, we'll end. Oh, we'll put them on the chart. Um, lots of fertilized eggs. Do you survive again? Kind of a low percentage chance. But you get that dispersal if you manage to attract the fish, and then but then you're dependent on where the fish can go, right? So if, you know if you if the fish you are depending on goes extinct, you're probably going to go extinct too. And we'll end with just um, some places where you can meet, not be able to see these species in the uh, in uh, your heart of the river here. Um, so red is northern pike. We know they try to spawn in some of these places. Thanks to Alex Benz for giving us the the lowdown on the pike spawning habitat here. Um, not all these places are definitely spawning pike every year, but they're the type of places where the pike would be interested in. Um, bluegill are going to be on these shoreline areas where there might be sand or gravel. They love those kind of places. And eelgrass is, uh, again, pretty widespread. You'll find it in more places than here, but you can definitely see it in that channel um, between the Lake Dakota and Lake Monona, um, and in other kind of shallow areas where that sunlight can so go out to the lakes and look for these species, and um, you know, give them a give them a little credit for all the hard work they're doing, just to just to make this next generation. Thank you. Questions? Right here. On the uh, bluegill nest, what you referred to as red. Yeah. Uh, do they? Make those anew each season, yeah. or do they rely on the structure from the previous season? Ever? Um, yeah, I think they're gonna, you know, just waves will eventually kind of move stuff around, new new material will come in and sell on top of it, so they gotta do that every year. Thanks. How do they know? I have a quick, sorry, yeah. quick follow up. Okay. How, how do the bluegill know the, the sneakers versus the, the good dads? You know, if it was us, we you know, would make that decision with emotions, the jellyfish, the freeze pose. <laughs> like, how does when a bluegill is born, how does one become a sneaker and one become a? Oh, but yeah. So, so if you are, if your father is a sneaker, you are more likely to be one. <laughs> <laughs> so it really isn't much different. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, more questions? Yeah. Right. Uh, effective zebras on natural parks and on beaches. Right. Do you have any nets? Knowledge of that or what's going to happen with that? Um. 
Um, that's a good question. Um, so this, what Zia Brussels do is, you know, they're going to, their filter feeders are taking nutrients out of the water column and kind of depositing it on the, the bottom of the lake. So you actually get a bunch of algal growth um, right on top of the zebra mussels, and then um, algal growth in the water column and on the surface, you get more surface scums. So as opposed as with macrophytes, um, I would think, you know, there's, I guess there's a potential for them to exist side by side because the zebra mussels will attach to hard surfaces and maybe the, the macrophytes um, are, are going to, are a different habitat, but you know, if, if, if you do, so the zebra mussels definitely encourage more algal blooms, which are in general bad for macrophytes because they can block out the sun um, and cause them to die. So I guess I'm not, I don't have a great answer for you, but that, that would be my guess. Right, so the, the carp are um, especially problematic because they will rip up aquatic vegetation um, as they're looking for food, nosing around. Um, and when they're spawning, they, they kind of do spawn in the same um, the shallow water area where pike do, so, and that also kicks up a ton of sediment. So whenever you have carp, you have more, the water is generally more cloudy because you're removing plants and you're kicking up sediment. Um, and that makes it, again, more favorable for algal Explain again how the, um, the zebra mussels cause more algae blooms. I was under the impression that I should clarify the water. So, um, because so they're taking um, nutrients out of the water column, like the middle part of the water, and they're depositing them on the bottom. Um, and then, so algae is growing on the bottom, and then there's there's fewer food for fish, so you can actually lose a bunch of your pelagic fish, which happen in uh, Lake Michigan. And where's Paul? Paul back in. How does what is it? How does it uh, cause more algal blooms in the water column? Can you repeat the question for me? He's asking about zebra mussels. How they cause more algal blooms, like on the surface scums? Oh well, um, they're generally filtering. Uh, they they rely on their filtering process to, to feed. So they're relying on the free floating uh, phytoplankton in the water column. So that's why they can clear up the water column. Blooming algae, which regulate their buoyancy right. and, and rise to the surface, and are also less palatable to the zebra mussels, are usually avoided. So that, that that way you get the more intense surface blooms because the nutrients are still there in the water column. Um, they're not they haven't gone away, but they have less competition with the, the free floating diatoms, which are the green algae. So blooming usually become more intense when those rise to the surface. Thanks, Paul. That was a great question, though. Thank you. Yeah. What do the mussels get from attaching to the gills other than dispersion? Well, um, so the, the gills are for the fish to get oxygen from the water. So my guess is that it's also giving those juveniles a, a rush of oxygen. And it's the fish is constantly swimming, right? So you're constantly getting fresh water over there. That would be my guess. I'm not sure. It might just be a suitable tissue for it. I know there's, um, there's kind of a the, the host fish will actually like create a little like casing around it, so it might be just that that tissue is particularly. And you know they've evolved together over thousands, thousands of years, so the fish kind of have this, you know. And like certain species will totally reject the mussels, but the, the fish that are suitable will kind of like produce a little some tissue around it. So I, I would guess that it has to do with that tissue, and also that it's really easy to drop off the gill, you know, as opposed to trying to. You know, inside the fish, it's harder to get out. And if you're on the scales, you know, the fish will shed scales pretty easily. So I think it's just the best site. Yeah. Are the visible the Yeah, they are kind of hard to see. Um, what you'll look for if you, if you scoop up some lake water, um, they have those big arms. And so they'll move in kind of uh, jerky motions. So they'll through the through your jar of lake water, um, they are you know they're transparent, so they're hard to see. Um, but even with if you're able to get like a little bit of magnification, uh, and you know maybe like pour the water out on a, like a little dish or something that's clear, and try to magnify with just like a hand lens or something, you you probably have a good shot at seeing them. Paul in the back. So. 
so interesting observation. I wonder if you, if you had some thoughts on this. Uh, on some lakes that had Eurasian water melt below, and then the base of the Lindsay Bell and all the Bear Lake and Hard Lake, uh, after aggressive weed harvesting programs, uh, uh, what's seen in many cases is the, that eelgrass species comes in uh, and, and takes over where the Eurasian water melt below used to be. Do, do they, do they, does that plant species use some kind of uh, survival mechanism that, or method of propagation that's enhanced by weed harvesting? That's a good question. I, you know, I guess my my knowledge of irrigation water milk, milk was that it is like really, really good at propagating because it just you know it can reproduce from just a single little weed slit. So to me, that suggests. You know, uh, maybe some of those tubers were, that were sitting in the sediment were disturbed by the harvesting, or, or it might just be that the removal created an opportunity and there were always, you know, little seeds and, and the fruits coming downstream and just the, the, it would create an opportunity. I wouldn't be surprised if those two plants produced chemicals to kind of to fight one another. And so if you give one of them a, if you give one of them a leg up, then it can maybe just Is the uh, eelgrass and uh, other beneficial water uh, plant species uh, susceptible to uh, herbicide runoff? Good question. Um, I, I'm not an expert on that, um, but I would guess to some degree, you know, it is. We, I mean, it's generally a good idea to keep herbicides and all sorts of things from the landscape from running into the lakes for many different reasons. So that's why we encourage everybody to, if you can, to have a buffer um, of some native tall native vegetation with deep roots between the lake and any, any lawn or anything, anything you're treating with herbicide. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. I'm sure someone at the end of this Is filamentous algae causing problems with all this reproduction? The one that like grows like a cloud? And on, the, on the bottom? Well, it, it starts at the bottom and then it grows up to the surface and then it turns brown and black. And right, yeah, that's, I think that's a native green algae. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think the only problem is that it does just grow a bunch and then it'll die off. Um, so, I think it's not directly um, harming these species. Um, except when it is just just because it's you know that it's taking up space and um, you know it's not great habitat because it's so dense you know but as far as I know it's not yeah there's no direct link between that and any of the species all right happy Valentine's Day yes <laughs>